Jordy. So I'm here today to talk about uh, plastics, microplastics in particular, and their effects on sand crabs in our safe beach ecosystem. So what are plastics exactly? We have a lot of different variations of what we think plastics are. We have a lot of different things in life in general. So your shampoo bottle, your fork that you get, um, your to-go container, uh, the thing that strawberries come in if you live anywhere near here. Um, all the hairbrushes, the straws, the plastic bags that we're putting in, uh, on the ballot to be banned this year in California. All of these things are plastics. Plastics aren't bad per se. We use a lot of medical instruments that are plastics and are really important for sterility as well. So this is just an idea of kind of the big things that I'm going to talk about. The other thing that I want you to remember is microbeads. So if you don't know, um, in California, microbeads were banned in production, but federally they're not banned until 2020. Um, I personally took this bottle and pulled out 300 milliliters of just microbeads in one bottle um, coming out into a sample. So this is a real big problem. I know it's a bigger problem even in the Great Lakes than we see out here. So that's just another sample of plastics. Other that we see are fibers. And a lot of people don't think about this is you get fibers from your clothing. So if you wear maybe something with spandex in it or like a cool running jacket or something like that, fibers shed, everything sheds, cotton sheds. We also get stuff from boats, uh, any kind of rope that you have. Not Most boating rope is not cotton. A lot of it's a uh, little polyethylene mix, I believe. And then we have um, straight plastic rope just because it's really hardcore and holds on to things. So specifically, microplastics are designated as anything under five millimeters. So we have a couple categories. We have what you would call as identifiable plastics. So these are things that are gonna be like a bottle cap that you might see, or a whole GI Joe still, or Barbie's actual leg. Uh, these are unidentifiable plastics, so little chunks. Like it's the broken off arm, and you can't really tell the it's more, or a brittle piece, because as plastics sit out in the sun, UV degrades them. So a lot of times when we're out picking up trash, you pick something up and it it basically disintegrates into a, you know, a million little pieces. It never goes away. It just gets smaller and smaller. Then we have nurdles, which are manufactured spheres. So if you've ever taken kids to the beach and those little yellow plastic shovels that we find everywhere, you take nurdles and melt them down into the plastic shovel shape. And then we have microbeads, which are these tiny, tiny pieces, as well as these tiny pieces of plastic that you wouldn't even realize what they are, because you can't see them usually unless you are looking at their scope. So where does trash belong? I know on Mondays it's trash day in my house, so I take my big plastic bag and I put it in my trash can and I wheel it down to the edge, and hopefully they take it out to the dump, you know, where all the seagulls live, right? Um, and they hang out here. It's compacted, it's not supposed to go anywhere, it's supposed to stay out of the water. Hopefully the wind doesn't blow too much of it away and put dirt on top of it. But a lot of times what we see is this, is you're driving along the side of the road, or you stop, and there's trash there. We get really windy days, especially here in the fall. You can see Anna start to blow, and there's a zillion pieces of trash along the highway. We also see a lot of trash out in our river systems. Um, the next talk after mine is Michaela Miller, and she'll be talking about marine debris, so that'll be something cool you're going to want to see. This photo is from the LA River after just a minor rainstorm last year, just the accumulation of trash coming out of there, and then like a big floating blob of fishing gear, derelict fishing gear that comes off the boats. So every time we have a storm event or any kind of wind event, this is the kind of stuff that we see. So we thought, you know what? I like to go to the beach. I enjoy it. I want to see. It's supposed to be pretty. This is out near my house. Um, that's a port we down there. Uh, you know, it's pretty nice. It's clean. The waves are pretty. It smells good. They groom this one, so there's no smell of kelp. I know it's bad for that ecosystem. But when you get close, what we found was all of this trash. So it's like a little piece of plastic. There's a straw. There's some leftover kelp, some leaves, some unidentifiable piece of blue trash. And this is just me leaning over and taking a photo. So this isn't really, really small. So still see with the naked eye. So we thought, if this is trash here, what about trash everywhere else? Are we seeing all this micro trash all over the place? So we checked it out. We collected sand from Marin County, which is north of San Francisco, all the way down to San Diego and out of the Channel Islands. 
um, San Luis and Santa Cruz. We had 51 beaches total. What we did is collected in about 200 milliliters of sand, mixed it up with a hypersaline solution, and filtered out the supernatant. And then you can see under the microscope, and I have some cool pictures, all the sand particles that are left over and anything that basically floats. Now, not all plastics float, as we found with some do sink, but the ones that do is what we've been able to find. We just categorized them visually by color, like blue strand, pink chunk. This is an example. This one's particularly gross to me because this is what I would call a blue blob. So this is about two millimeters. This is all sand. There's like a little piece of miniature something in there. Um, this stuff comes out of the bottles that also have the microbeads, so like your face wash. It's some sort of cohesive material that they put in there. With So when I filtered out the beads, also these like gooey, gross chunks came out of it. And then when we found it in the sand, I thought it was pretty disgusting. This is a microfiber. So something that I was talking about, when you wash your clothes, it's an average of a couple hundred to a thousand fibers per load go into your gray water. So your gray water goes in with your sewage and out to the reclamation plant. And we don't really have a physical way to filter those out yet. So that's how they're getting out into the system. So these are different fibers, and this is the majority of what we find. So we thought for sure, you know, ooh, microbeads are cool. We're gonna look at that. And really what we find is mostly microfibers out there. So we were concerned, you know, are we finding plastics or not? That's something that we looked at. Here is the fun sand data. So on this axis, you have the number of fibers are in yellow. And as you can see, that's way more than the number of particles. These are the beaches going from north to south. And then here are the islands here. So interesting enough, in the islands, even though the amount of anthropogenic effects are a lot smaller because they're uninhabited per se, except for obviously we had like Helena, um, we had a lot of fibers out there and a lot more big particles. So that was kind of interesting. We're going to check that out more. And then all the way down to San Diego. So there's no real trend as to where it is or what it is. Um, we went all the way down to this cutoff <coughs> down here, San Onofre. Um, and you, you just, there's no beach. We haven't found a beach without microplastics in it so far. And we've tested beaches around the world through some other projects. And we literally have not found a clump of sand without microplastics yet. So, Sand crabs live in the sand, right? Everybody know what a sand crab looks like? Show you a picture a second. So it's the most abundant uh, sandy beach in Burbank. They burrow down, they're filter feeders, and they have, we figured they had a fairly high potential for trash ingestion, just because this is what they look like. So this guy I brought back to the lab, and here are his little feeding appendages. So they burrow it down into the sand, and then they take their appendages and go like this. They have all these little cilia here, and as soon as they feel something, they just slurp it up. So it doesn't matter what it is. They don't have a taste tester first. They eat it no matter what. So with sand crabs, the next guy up the food chain we found a surf perch. That's 90% of their diet is sand crabs. So we see that out in the ocean. Um, if anybody likes to fish, about 2 million sand crabs are used for bait each year. I know when I told my dad about this project, he was like, oh yeah. You should take them out, throw them in the bucket. They're the best thing for surf fishing up here. Shorebirds eat them, and as well as our sea otters eat them. So they're getting into the food chain. These are the sample sites that I have marked for where we actually collected the sand crabs. So all the way up here, out on the islands, and then down through the counties. We had 38 of those beaches originally from the sand beaches that we collected. I had some help from some other universities sending me samples. We got about 10 crabs per beach, and then opened each one up and looked just visually whether or not it had a fiber or a particle inside of it. We were able to ID a sample set of what we took using the FTAR, which is this really cool microscope. I'll show you in just a second. Here's my famous crab that got a cool picture. It's a little microbeads. We tried to feed them microbeads in the beginning, but they didn't really like that. <laughs> It's kind of mean, you know, it's like torturing things in the lab. So this is my setup with this cool camera on top, so I have to take pictures like this, you know, to like gross out people. Like this is what I'm doing in the lab all day, chopping up sand crabs. So this is a picture of the microfiber that I found inside the sand crab. So this is the stomach, and I pulled it out, and, uh, zoomed way in, and squished it for you. And this was one of the, what the fibers look like inside of there. So it's a distinct 
obviously not something that you usually find. It does not look like anything else that is inside of the sand crab, so that's how we were able to initially identify it. Here's a fiber that was interesting. It was like stuck inside of the tissue of the sand crab, so I don't know how it migrated there exactly, but I found quite a few like this that would be actually inside as if it was stuck into. This was my very first microbead, and only one of like three that I found that a sand crab actually ate down in Orange County. So I decided to do the show. So this is our data from sand crabs. So as you can see here, the beach locations from north to south. So not that you know what, where Baker Beach is unless you live near San Francisco. It goes all the way south here to San Diego. In here are the Channel Islands beaches. And every single sample that I had had at least one crab so that had ingested plastics. Here on the x-axis uh, is the proportion of sand crabs that had actually ingested. So if, you, if I had one crab in 10, it would be here, or four crabs in 10, and that's how it's set up this way. So again, there's no specific trend as to the location of the beach or the location out on the islands as to whether or not they were ingesting plastics. It's just that we found at least one and no reason for that. Overall, 35% of the entire sand crab population that we collected had it ingested some sort of ambient or had some sort of ambient microfiber. So this isn't me in the lab feeding them stuff to see whether or not they would ingest it. We just went out and scooped them up and found that they had been ingesting all of this stuff. 100% of the sand has microparticles in it micro trash. We literally have not found a beach without trash, so I'm just curious to see what else we're going to find. In order to figure out whether or not it was actually plastic that we had seen, we used this fancy microscope. So this is a gold-plated slide. Has anybody ever used one of these? I was not allowed to touch it. I just had to watch her do it. Um, we put little samples on here, and then it shoots a light through this special little crystal and tells you what it is, and it gives you like a, a little computer read exactly what the DNA of the material is. So we found polypropylene, which is your basic plastic container. Polyester, like I said, your favorite running jacket. This one's fun. Polypropylene ethylene copolymer is really just tile chalk, like on your bathroom or maybe used on a boat. Polyethylene, which are the microbeads and plastic bags that I spoke about. Polyacrylate, which is just another form of plastic. And then we also found non-plastics like cotton, synthetic cellulose, as well as other cellulose fibers. So these are the kinds of things that we found when we took a sample popular, like just a sample set to test out to see what we had. So the important part about this is that now that we've discovered that sand crabs are eating these plastics, is that they are a potential pathway into the food web. And maybe people don't really care about that, but we eat fish, most people do, not everybody. And so if the plastics are getting into the crabs and into the fish, then possibly into us. Since we eat at the top of the food web, this is my favorite surf writer poster here. You know, your plastic sushi, for everybody that goes out and eats sushi, they're not gross, right? The dangerous part about this is that it has been proven that plastics attract pollutants, so PCBs, DDT, and other persistent organic pollutants that are in the soil and in the water. And so if those are transferred into other tissues, they can be harmful to humans, which has already been shown to be transferred into fish tissues by other scientists. So these have been shown to be endocrine disruptors, neurological defect problems, as well as reproductive issues and immune disruptions. The take home that I want for you guys is not to be sad, but uh, microplastics have been found over 700 kilometers of our California coast out on our channel of the sea. This is a newly recognized pathway into coastal fluva. And these microplastics are known, plastics in general are known to accumulate these harmful chemicals. So we really need to pay attention to this problem. The things that you can do are easy. I'll give you a heads up about that. So we think that trash belongs in our trash can and down out into you know, the dump, right? But what we're really finding is that the trash is making it out onto our beautiful beaches. So the things that you can do are not use some used plastics, not use um, extra stuff. You know, ask for a paper bag or bring your own. Little stuff, you know, vote in November. So that's my important.